Hi all, welcome to my talk on the challenge of ethical design. So first off, a little bit about me. I'm Bella. I work for a Midwest-based custom software consultancy, Atomic Object. I'm presenting from a very chilly Ann Arbor, Michigan today, where just last night we got about six inches of snow. So we are living up to our Michigan reputation here. Um, you can probably tell this picture here is a little old, but for some reason, work did not send a photographer to my home this year to get a more recent photo in sweats and a hoodie. A little bit more about me. My background is in user experience and human-centered design. In my current role, I have the opportunity to work as a nuts-to-bolt designer who does a little bit of every part of the design process and provides end-to-end -end solutions to my clients. Being a consultant puts me in a very unique position of working with a lot of different clients who are in very different businesses and who are in different design maturities. So some have a UX team, some may have never worked with a designer before and everything in between. So to get started, let's take a few seconds and jot down or consider what do you think is the challenge of ethical design? Um, feel free to add this to the UXOK -OK channel in the Teklahoma Slack, or feel free to keep it to yourself. Okay, moving on. Um, I'm going to start here with a disclaimer. So today, I will not be trying to convince you why or if it's important to be an ethical designer. Um, I'm not here to tell you why you should be interested in ethical design or to provide a moral compass for you as a designer. I'm gonna leave all the judgment to your pets. Um, I don't have a corgi, but I do have a dog. So I get a lot of that at home right now. Um, there's so many examples over the past few years as to why ethical design is important. It's even at the point where my sister will call me up and say, have you seen the social dilemma? If you're here today, I'm assuming that you know why this is important. So that aside, a little bit about my story. So I first started hearing about ethical design a few years ago at tech conferences and around the edge of my social circle. Much as with other things that are good for the world, like trying to eat less meat or decreasing my reliance on paper one-time use plastics, I thought to myself, okay, this is great hypothetically, but what will it take for me to truly be an ethical designer? So when I got, first got started, and perhaps you had a similar experience, I thought the challenge of ethical design would be things like, okay, what, what is it to begin with? Where do I start? Will this be expensive for me, my clients, the companies I work for? Can I do it wrong? Is this going to be a lot of work, a really big change to my process? I'm here to tell you today that it is not that hard and I'm going to try to make it really simple for you. I'm going to provide frameworks, tools, and anecdotes around our considerations as designers when we think about who uses our product, how our product is used, when we're doing research and testing, when we talk about what our product looks like. I'm also going to give a brief definition as to what I'm using as ethical design for this talk. And at the end, we'll get to what I really see as the challenge of ethical design given how like given these frameworks that i'm providing for you um this presentation is by no means exhaustive and it's not comprehensive because we only have about 45 minutes it is intended to be a practical guide that you can start using today and that is supposed to get you thinking so let's get started um how am i defining ethical design for the purposes of this presentation when I first started looking into ethical design, I found this kind of long description of design ethics. So this is coming from encyclopedia.com. So they're saying that design ethics guide how we work, how we conduct the design process, how we determine features for products, and how we assess the ethical significance of the products that we're designing. So based on this argument uh, or this definition, I think it's fair to argue that ethical design is ethically working, ethically conducting a design process, ethically determining features, and then of course, assessing the ethical significance. This result or this definition felt really big. And so I thought to myself, okay, is there something that will give us a bit better of a framework when we think about ethical design? So I found 
this great article by Leonard. You can find his full article at a list of part. I've linked it here and at the end of the slide, I also have resources and that you can just have all my resources from my talk. So Leonard breaks our focus areas of design ethics into eight parts. So usability, accessibility, privacy, user involvement, persuasion, focus, sustainability, and society. He defines usability as our moral obligation as designers to create products that are intuitive, safe, and free from errors that may or may not be life-threatening. He defines accessibility as not just thinking about who benefits from our solutions, but also thinking about who may influence the behavior and thoughts of our users. Focus, he defines as how we think about how we're treating our users' time and how we're respecting their time or not. And sustainability and society both look at sort of these larger ways our designs can affect the world's environment and also the society in which it's being used. For the purposes of this talk today, I'm really going to focus on a subset of these. So usability and accessibility, user involvement, persuasion and focus, and society, because I feel like those are the ones as designers we have the most direct impact on. And um, I feel like privacy and sustainability are things we kind of have to partner a little bit more with our companies and developers to have an impact on, but we'll get into that. I also wanted to quickly define a term I'll be using a lot today, which is bias. I'm defining bias as the conscious and unconscious assumptions about our users that slip in without our notice into our design process. I think we need to combat this bias by recognizing it, removing known biasing triggers where possible and designing for users of different abilities. And I'm going to be talking a lot about that today. So I'd like you to take a quick minute and think about, does your definition of ethical design match mine or does it differ? Great, so we had a little bit of technical difficulties. Um, the previous slide we left off on was thinking about your definition of ethical design and if it matches mine. We got a little bit of extra time to think about that. So now we're gonna talk about adjusting our thinking and practice to be more ethical when we consider who uses our product. So when I was a younger designer and perhaps you had a similar experience, I was taught that when you think about who uses your product, you really group your target users, develop personas. Um, I know some people love and hate personas, but for the, for the purposes of this talk, we're going to say you develop personas or something similar, and you determine a primary persona and design for them. Um, I found this example of what I think shows a pretty typical standard traditional persona. It has things like goals and frustrations, motivations, biography. A bio or scenario. It also has some things that I don't think we necessarily need to understand our end user and some things that are actually quite biasing, such as their name, a photo, their gender or age, and their personality. I also think for the purposes of most of the products that we're designing for, we don't need things like marital status, number of kids, or education. I know there's specific products that this might be useful for, 
But overall, I think that some of these things that are involved and included in our traditional personas really are biasing when we think about our users. Instead, I've transitioned to using a slightly modified product specific persona. So I keep things like the goals and frustrations, understanding the motivations of our users and specific characteristics that may be very you know, unique to your product or market. But I really try to think about what does my product do for this user? But you may be thinking, oh no, you took some things out of that persona that are really useful, things like technical skill and personality. I'd like to propose that we keep these things, but in a more inclusive, standardized way by thinking about our users' abilities, by running our designs across a varied variety of abilities, instead of assuming that our personas are sort of having these perfect Instagram-worthy days. How can we do this? Um, I used to do this much more ad hoc, but I recently found this great tool called Cards for Humanity, which I think is really great. Shown on this screen are two screenshots from Cards for Humanity. Each screen shows two cards that you can randomly flip between and drive the scenario against your designs. Um, the user cards have characteristics such as impatient, shy, or overconfident, things that any of your users may be feeling or may embody. The needs cards have a number of needs that may range from physical conditions like a tremor or being hard of hearing to other conditions such as having difficulty using a computer. The examples here really show two random examples that I flipped on the cards. So we have a user who's very impatient and has a tremor and a user who's shy and partially sighted. Um, on the screen, one of the cards has been flipped and you can see there's additional considerations for you as a designer as you think through each of these use cases, making sure that your designs really stand up to the use of actual humans. And again, not sort of assuming the ability of your users when they come and use your product. Another thing that I think is a really interesting space is to think about how your designs could be used by someone with a mental health condition or someone going through a mental health crisis. This could be as short as having a bad day or being frustrated or just really hungry, but it could be larger and thinking about users who are going through something more. Um, for example, what would a fitness app look like if it was designed with a user with an eating disorder in mind? And what would a task management app look like if it was designed with someone who is anxious in mind? I'm not sure if there's like a great ethical way to validate this, but I think it's a really interesting way to think about our designs. So what are the benefits to this approach? I've found this approach is really useful as it does remove the parts of our personas that may be unconsciously biasing or stereotyping. And instead it's more focused on our users, their lives and how technology and product really serves them. This is also a much more inclusive approach when it comes to the different ways that our humans are coming to use our designs. So many people have shown this graphic. This is again, our Microsoft inclusive design toolkit dra graphic, but just as when we design for a user who has one arm, we're also designing for a user who may have their hand full with a baby or their groceries or a dog. Um, this change, if you currently have a workflow that does any sort of review, past personas or different kinds of user groups, this is a change you could make today. It's fairly low cost. It isn't a huge investment because it is really just a different lens through which to run your existing designs and your existing process. So now I'd like you to take a quick minute and think about what would your projects look like if you implemented these personas and human-centered practices? Okay. And I'm sure I'll see all of this at the end of the presentation when I finally have time to look through the Slack. So I'm not trying to ignore any of you who are leaving comments there. So next up, let's talk about how our product is used and how we can adjust our thinking and practice to be a little bit more ethical when we're doing that part of the design process. So when I was younger and I was in school, they taught me that when you think about how your product is used, you really create a user journey or workflow for your target personas capture edge cases and prioritize features accordingly. Um, 
this is a very good practice, but I think in addition to going through workflows or journeys, we have an opportunity to do speculative design. I've seen this called a lot of different things, but for the sake of this talk, I'm going to define speculative design as a scenario or activity that allows us to consider larger issues that may arise when our products are out in the world. Um, these activities can help us identify risk, stress test our products, and consider the implications to society. These aren't things that you can necessarily prove using research, but they are scenarios that have happened to other companies, and we now know can happen to any of us. The first tool I'd like to recommend is Tarot Cards of Tech. Um, this tool lets you flip through various product scenarios in a card-like fashion. It, you can flip through it digitally or download it as a PDF if you prefer. This screen shows two different views of the tarots of tech, tarot cards of tech tool. The first one is showing a card flipped that is proposing that we think about if two user, if two friends could use your product, how could it enhance or detract from their relationship? The other card that's flipped says, what happens when 100 million people use your product? As you can see, these cards are using a number of scenarios that we have already seen in tech. Some of the other cards that aren't flipped are things like what would happen if an influencer used your product for their own gain? What happens if there's a scandal around your product? Or how does your product affect mother nature? Another way you can explore various scenarios is through a bad actor exercise. So I've seen this concept only a few times. It doesn't seem to have a standard name. Marisa Morby calls them bad actors and Kim Crawford calls them villainous personas. At the end of the day, they're users who intentionally or unintentionally cause harm using your product or technology. On the screen here is a bad actor matrix. It's a lightweight framework I have created off of one developed by Kim Crawford. Um, her larger framework and her blog post can be found at the link here or at the end of this slide deck. I'm going to talk through my lighter weight framework that I use. So this framework has two rows. The rows allow you to capture intentional and unintentional bad actors. The columns are capturing different kinds of users. So these users might be view-only users, moderating users, content creation users. And then at the end of those columns of users, there's a column for thinking about how our app admins, designers, developers, and different people who are part of the creation process can intentionally or unintentionally cause harm using the product. And also users unknown outside the system. A, a time I found this exercise useful was when designing for an application that collected user emotional trends based on voice. The client um, wanted a feature that allowed users to share their data along the lines of because kids these days are always sharing stuff on Instagram and Facebook, even personal things. So let me show you what this matrix would look like filled out. In our columns, we have two kinds of users, users who are creating emotion data and users who have access to view that data. Under our users who are creating data, we can have an intentional bad actor who writes a bad review and could create a bad or poor experience for using our product. We also have an impatient user who could unintentionally bail during onboarding and delete the app and never get the benefits of this application. Things get a little bit more interesting in the column about users who view data. So unintentionally or intentionally users who view data could take advantage of that data by intentionally trolling, by intentionally using that data to take advantage or abuse someone else, or by using that data to manipulate someone. So seeing someone's having a bad day and use that time to take advantage of them. Under unintentional, bad actors who may be viewing data, we had two kinds of users who we identified. So a worrier who would be someone who's a very well-intentioned but over-concerned friend or family member who may overreact to negative moods and say, I see you're having a bad day, what's going on? Tell me more. We also identified an unintentional bad actor who would kind of be like a bad friend who may have access to your data and either doesn't care to check on how you're doing or when they see you're having a bad day, doesn't know how to help. All of these users can intentionally or unintentionally cause harm to our primary users who are creating that data in the system by either taking advantage of or not knowing how to respond properly to the data they're seeing. 
Under app designers and admins, obviously there's intentional and unintentional data use or data breach or loss. And under unknown users outside the systems, uh, there could be an intentional hacker who's trying to take advantage of data. And we identified outside the system, an unintentional user who could cause harm to our users in the system is someone who undermines the value of the app by proposing that emotion data isn't important or that the app is improperly creating data. Based on this ma matrix, we were actually able to deprioritize the data sharing and perhaps put a few more considerations around sharing something so sensitive and personal like your emotion data. For each of these bad actors, I then identified their goals, motivations, and how they might use my product to cause harm. At this point, you can also consider, you know, how can I change my designs to, if possible, prevent harm being caused. I think it's also an interesting place to identify a risk or threat level and really think about, okay, who are these users who are most likely to be coming into my system and either hurting my other users or taking advantage of the system to steal data or something similar. I think this exercise is so important, especially when your application involves sharing between users and users or users in the web. So anytime you have data storage in a cloud, a comment or chat functionality, these areas and features are really ripe for misuse and human effects both positive and negative. So what is the benefit of doing this speculative design? I think these exercises give us an opportunity to catch areas of high risk that may otherwise be missed or cause trouble down the road. Um, they also could lead to new areas of product discovery and perhaps a better product for all users. These exercises are really nice in that of both the exercises I showed, they can be completed in a few hours. It's not work that you have to do frequently, maybe only a few times a year. I think it's something that we can aspire to when we are designing and thinking about how users might use our product in order to prevent sort of mishaps that we've seen do happen with products that are out in the wild or that have been around for a while. So I'd like you to take a minute and think about, would you use these exercises in your practice? And are there any speculative design exercises that I missed that you really love? So let's take a minute and write those down or share them in the chat. Okay, I know a lot of you are working specifically in a user research user research role or user experience research role. And I think even in this role, you can have considerations and things that you can do to adjust your practice to be a little bit more ethical. Um, so let's talk a little bit about that. So this maybe goes without saying, but the best way I think to engage in ethical design as a researcher is to actually conduct user research and testing with your end users. I think data-driven design is important, but I feel it's equally important to actually talk to your end users who are using your tool. I cannot tell you how many clients I have worked with who do not have an active practice of getting user feedback from their actual end users. And when they're pushed to really put a little bit of time into user interviews and user testing, they learn things that they either didn't know about their users or that significantly changed the priority of their features because they simply weren't talking to their users and getting that insight about what their users actually are looking for and needing. If you are doing user research in your organization, I would highly recommend conducting research with people outside your personal social circle. I do completely understand when you're starting out with a new product, it's easy and cheap to reach out to your friends and family but it does really bias your results to people who hang out with someone like me. And there are so many ways to widen your pool of research participants. A lot of my clients uh, have a sign up on their website or on their Facebook and they provide, um, you know, like they'll offer a reduced subscription rate or something like that. That doesn't really cost a lot, but gives you access to a lot of your end users. I also highly recommend some level of user management to prevent duplicates. 
I think it's really good to make sure we're reaching out to different kinds of people, not the same person over and over again. I would also recommend making sure that you're reaching out to people of various ages, geographic locations, and life experiences. If you can't get people who are of different ages or life experiences signed up in your beta testing group, wherever that might be, I would highly recommend using a tool like Validately, who I think was bought out by user Zoom. I haven't used them since they were bought, but there's all these online tools where they actually do the recruitment to a very wide audience for you. And you can just sign up and it's a little bit more expensive than doing it yourself, but you can actually get access to those users outside of your pool who you're able to with your beta testing. Lastly, I would really recommend actually testing your actual site or web app with your users instead of just your prototype. I'm sure a lot of you saw on Twitter, there was a recent post where someone with the two letter last name was unable to sign up on a form as there was a three character limit. This could have been prevented by conducting user testing with a wide group of people. In addition to widening your research pool to include different kinds of people, there's also a number of best practices and facilitation around user research. Um, I highly recommend reading IDEO's little book of design research ethics, which is linked to here, or reading Nielsen Norman's group post on ethical majority and user research. Both of these resources are free. And as someone who's, I'm sure you can tell, pretty passionate about unbiased user research methods, I learned a lot and really enjoyed the read. As I mentioned, all this stuff is linked in my articles and it's also, I have a references section at the end of this talk. So what are the benefits of this approach? Um, I think the number one benefit is it doesn't take a lot of time to brush up on your current practices. And it isn't prohibitively expensive to widen your pool of participants. Uh, this will lead to better user research results. I think it is a little bit more work if you are in that really difficult place of having to advocate for user research in a company that doesn't currently do it or in a like whether you're in a company or wherever you work at, it can be difficult. Um, I actually think Kevin did a really good job talking about this. So I would highly recommend watching his talk if you wanna know more about this. So let's all take a moment and think about when is the last time that you brushed up on the latest research practices or considered your bias? Okay, let's carry on and talk about how we can ethically, there we go, got that slide updated, how we can adjust our thinking and practice to be more ethical when we consider what our product looks like. It should come to no surprise after all the talks we had today that I'm going to talk about accessibility. I highly recommend watching all the talks from this morning if you want to know more about this as well. Um, I have made it a habit throughout my design process to do a few checks. Um, one of them is checking my color contrast using WebAIM's contrast checker. I've linked to it in the slides and I'm also going to have it in the resources section at the end. I also love to run my color palettes through color blindness simulators. I really like this one by David Nichols that is shown here on the screen. It lets you enter the hex values for all of the colors in your color palette and then see immediately how they would look for different kinds of colorblind users. Um, it's really easy to do, it doesn't take a lot of time, and you can really quickly take a screenshot and show it to the client and say, you know, you can see as the client, this is not going to work if you have, you know, a red-green color indicator, or whatever the case may be. I also ran this talk by a really good friend, Rachel Leggett, who has been linked to down below, who is a developer specialized in accessibility, and she recommended some things I was leaving out. So she recommended making sure that we have uh, designs provided for developers that include visible focus. So can users who are not using a mouse navigate through your site by using the tab button? And can they see what's been selected as they're filling out a form? She also recommended making sure our important content is not in. This is something 
I sometimes forget about, but if content is embedded in trouble seeing it, if you zoom in, it's going to be something like dev to is something that we can really make sure that we're sharing with developers and make sure that we're providing appropriate for them if we have to hand off in a more waterfall fashion, which I know some of us are in companies where we still have to do that kind of handoff. I also wanted to recommend looking at Humane by Design. Um, this is a great tool that gives us a list of Humane by Design practices. And something I really love about his tool is that it actually has a section, if you scroll down, on each of the Humane by Design best practices that is focused on user interfaces. So he's actually taken sort of each of his design practices and identified ways that we can implement them directly in our user interfaces. Um, there's other great things on this site, but I think the best practices section is something that's a really useful check when you're designing interfaces to make sure that you're considering your users. Lastly, I really recommend avoiding shady design patterns. I know this got a lot of attention in the social dilemma. Um, I would hope that we consider avoiding using manipulative and addictive design patterns. The Ethical Design Handbook has a really good overview of different manipulative and addictive design patterns that we can try to avoid and sort of why they're negative. Um, I would highly recommend reading this book if you're interested more in sort of avoiding these shady design patterns. So what are the benefits to including these things in your approach as a designer? Again, inclusivity, we have heard it over and over again today and even in this talk. I also think it's a really great opportunity to think about long-term what is good for our users and society instead of only you know, what is increasing the click rate today. Obviously, if you're in a place where your metric is click rate, you can do that, but maybe also consider other things. Um, for things like accessibility, it definitely can be a little bit more work to catch up if you haven't included this from the start of your application. But I think if you make a plan, it's something you can start working through. Um, and it just takes a little bit of time. So again, uh, do you currently use accessibility tools in your daily practice? And are there any tools that I missed that you prefer to use that you can put in the Slack channel? Yeah, Chris, your comment is true. Doing those accessibility audits is sometimes a little disheartening. Okay, continuing on. So what do I really see as the true challenge of ethical design? So given all these practices that are not a huge change to our existing workflow in most cases, um, that can lead to more ethical design. I'm going to come back to this original prompt of the talk. What do I see as the true challenge of ethical design? I think it's that we can't do it alone. I think we are in a great place as we look forward to the future of ethical design to bring our teams on board. So many people work on our teams, managers, developers, people who write algorithms who are often also developers, um, people in our company like CEOs. I think now is a great time to consider if you are able. Pushing your product team or company to make a, stand, a statement around ethical practices, and it might include things like metrics that consider the impact on user longer-term health in society, um, a commitment to accessibility, investing in ethical design practices, and of course, investing in diverse hiring. Um, it kind of goes without saying that the more diverse our teams are, the better the design that we're going to be creating is. Also, I see, especially given the things that have happened, like especially like in America over the past year and in other places over previous years, I see in, that there's going to be more and more legislation written about how our digital products should behave. I think there's a likelihood, and in fact, there's current examples of legislation written in a way without the voices of people like ethical designers in the room that have served to further marginalize and silence communities and small businesses rather than affecting positive change in our digital products. 
So all in all, today you've been equipped with a number of tools that can empower you to become a more ethical designer today. You've also been prompted to think about the future of ethical design and how it includes more than just us, but it also needs to include our teams and our societies. Um, I'm gonna open up the floor to questions now and thank you. Hey, Bella, that was fantastic. Uh, let's dive right into some questions. Thank you, and I'll try to catch up with, I know I saw you guys write in comments and I missed it, or you all. <laughs> That's, we should have, here we go. <laughs> I was gonna say, well, you had so many good questions that I feel like we should have wrote them out and actually had people respond in real time because it's just kind of a stream of consciousness, but yeah. oh well. Here we go. Um, okay, so uh, does taking away the specifics make the persona is less relatable to those making uh, or developing the product? It might. I, ha I haven't found it does for me because you focus more on like, what can the product actually do for my user? So instead of focusing sort of on, you know, like, are they married or do they have kids? You can really focus on what specific problem is my design solving for these users and not, you know, kind of like, what do they do in their free time? I mean, I think those things, depending on the app you're building, can be included. So if you're designing a fitness app, it should include things about their fitness. Um, but for the most part, I don't think you need that stuff in there unless it really directly ties into the product that you're building. No, no, I really like that. That's, yeah, the relatable data make is the necessary stuff. Yeah. Um, okay, uh, Christy asks, What's your favorite way to explain ethical design to product owners, managers, or stakeholders, or to developers? Yeah, which, yeah, how do you? Oh, what's that's your, a great question. What's your, your go-to analogy? Oh, wow, I don't know the answer for that. Um, I usually just say, you know, like, think about who's using your product. Think about what it looks like when your grandma uses her phone. Like. I don't know if you all do tech support for your grandmas, but my grandma calls me up and she's like, I cannot hear the swoosh sound when I send emails. And I have like, it's the, the silence button on your phone, grandma. So I just, you know, try to make it relatable for them and make sure that they're thinking about, you know, you can't assume that your users are coming with a certain set of abilities that are maybe consistent for like, you know, um, the people that we typically write our personas for, like someone our age or someone who has similar life experiences as ours. That 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 is the analogy we needed. That's perfect. <laughs> um, okay, uh, what do you do to identify both negative and positive consequences of products you design? Are there methods you think are helpful to surface this data? Are they? Can you restate the question? Yeah. So how, how do you determine the, the good and bad that can come from, good, good and bad consequences from using products you design? Yeah, how do you? I, I do try to do that speculative design thinking. As I mentioned, like I use that bad actor matrix and I do, I haven't used tarot cards for, or tarot cards for tech entirely, but I do try to run them through scenarios thinking about the kinds of users. As I said, like if you're doing sharing, or if you're doing any sort of data to a cloud, I think there's a lot more space where things can go wrong instead of someone just tracking their data. I also try to think about, okay, um, what is the wrong way to think about the data we're showing? So for example, especially with that emotion app, it's really interesting to think about most of us spend our day in a neutral emotional state. So how can we reinforce that it's good to have a neutral emotion and not to be you know, switching between being super happy and then super sad. Like that's not how we typically feel and how our emotions would be recorded throughout the day. So also thinking about, okay, what are the ways that someone looking at my tool or using my tool might misuse it or might misinterpret what they're seeing? 
Um, so I do spend a little bit of time in that speculative design space, just thinking about, okay, what would this look like if it were out in the world or if someone was using it who didn't have the context that I have. Gotcha. This one, I, I feel like it's, it's similar. Um, how do you validate the bad actor personas? That is something someone else asked me who I ran this talk by. Um, I have not yet validated them. I feel like most of the ones that I use are coming from common scenarios that have already happened. And I really don't know how you could validate something like you can't be like, hey, this user is a troll. We'll do user research with them and see how they troll people. So I think the speculative design can be really difficult because we can't necessarily always prove it with research without maybe like going into unethical research practices, which is a double, you know, can I prove it without being an unethical researcher? I don't know. Um, but I think they, you can look at what has already happened with our, with our products that are out there. Like what has, what happened to cause the social dilemma? What happened to, um, you know, like, like I also was saying, like thinking about users who are different mental states can help. So making sure that you're thinking about, okay, how would this app feel if I just got in a car accident? Like if I'm building an insurance app, what does it feel like if I just got in a car accident and I have that trauma and I'm trying to like process reality at the same time I'm using this app? I think we can run our apps by various scenarios that happen to everyone and just try to be the most empathetic that we can. Yeah. So I'm that, building an insurance oh, app right oh, now. That's so that's, oh, that's just such yeah. a good example. Oh man. Um, okay. Uh, all right. Uh, just have you seen any manipulative designs and do you have any examples of that? I think a good example would be uh, the most classic example, I think would be forcing you to enter your email in when you go to a website or forcing you to enter your email and give over your data to get 10% off or whatever. I mean, that's obviously not a terrible manipulative design or something like the infinite scroll, I think is another one I've seen cited. There's a few of them. Um, I like read that book I recommended, but then didn't want to pull quotes out of it without asking the authors. So I also don't want to like plagiarize their work, but I would highly recommend reading the book in the slides, the design ethics book. For sure. Um, and then I think this is the final question. Uh, what do you recommend for testing cognitive issues uh, other than human testing? So I actually saw this done really well at a workshop by DQ. They're our local accessibility group that does audits and you know fixes sites to make sure they're accessible. And their workshop, they actually had us like try to use a phone while wearing mittens or try to complete a task while wearing like drunk goggles that make everything blurry and try to complete a task on your phone while, and they actually used physical objects to try to do that testing. Um, something I always think about is, you know, what's it feel like to use your phone when it's wet and the keys don't really respond or uh, tools like that. There's also a few plugins for Chrome. I can't think of them right now that actually will display your page at different levels of visibility, which is kind of nice. So you can see what your page would look like if you had like lower vision or if you had floaters that were floating across the screen. Um, also the color contrast checker helps, but I will see if I can find a link to that DQ workshop because they did it really, really well. That's, that's awesome. Let me see if I can get that after I'm done here. Well, uh, uh, what, what's the best way for people to get in contact with you or to follow you online? I'll put it on the Slack channel. Um, and also the bit.ly link to my talk should just link directly to the talk and I'll add a slide there so that all of you know how to contact me. Excellent. Uh, well, Bella, thank you so much for talking to us today. Uh, this has been great. You you are the best penultimate speaker we could hope for. Uh, oh, so, thank you. Yeah. Um, thank you again and we'll, uh, thank you. Thank you too. Have a great evening or morning depending on your time zone.